Good afternoon. For those of us who, for those of you who have just joined us, David Rouse is my name, advisor on multi-unit developments and owners management companies with the housing agency. You're very welcome to our uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I will uh, share my slides and go through the uh, housekeeping and so on for this afternoon's uh, for this afternoon's uh, session. So uh, we will uh, have our, our presentations at about uh, 10 past 12 after I do some uh, introductions. Presentations from myself and John will, uh, from John and myself in that order in fact, will run until about uh, quarter to one. We'll have uh, 10, 15 minutes for uh, our Q&A session and we will uh, wrap up and close by one o'clock and get you back to your, uh, get you back to your day. So while we are uh, waiting on any of our participants to uh, to join us, we might uh, run a poll, uh, which uh, will just allow people to uh, register in a couple of minutes. Uh, people might be late joining us. I'm going to launch that poll now, and you should see that now. So we'd be grateful for your feedback on that. And uh, the question is, what category best describes your role? So really, we're uh, seeking just to get a, a profile of uh, of who's with us uh, this afternoon. We're conscious we do have a diverse uh, audience. We have, of course, members of the Institute. And again, we're very grateful to, to Pranish, to Sandra Campbell, uh, to Teresa Hart and colleagues for their assistance in the background in setting up the uh, the session. The poll is anonymous, so please uh, please do uh, engage with us on that uh, to uh, to understand um, the, the audience. So. Um, as I say, the question is, what category best describes your role? Are you an architect in private practice, an architect in the public sector? Are you in uh, academia or are you in uh, another uh, professional uh, body? So engineers, QSs and so on. And then uh, anyone else in, in the other category might be kind enough just to flag to us and signal their, uh, their uh, status or their uh, role uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. And it will just, uh, just be helpful to us from a background point of view, as I say it is. Um, it is anonymous, so thank you again for uh, for uh, voting on that and just uh, or for uh, completing the survey rather. And uh, I'll stop that uh, poll uh, now because it's three minutes past twelve, and I think we have sufficient, perhaps, grace period for all our attendees to uh, to join us. So thank you very much for um, submitting your uh, responses on that. And um, I will uh, go back to uh, sharing my screen now to go through the rest of our, <coughs> excuse me, our housekeeping. Uh, as I say, that's our timetable for this afternoon. We would, uh, we would remind you in terms of housekeeping to uh, use the Q and A function uh, to type in your questions to uh, to our panelists and our speakers uh, at the towards the end of the session. If you're having any problems with the tech. Or if you see any problems from our perspective in the sense you can't hear or see us or there's a difficulty with anything, uh, please use the chat function for that. And my colleagues, <clears throat> Katrina Lawler and Mary Coffey are available in the background uh, to keep an eye on that and they'll flag to me any, any issues around that and keep us, uh, keep us posted on any problems. Uh, as we would have flagged at the, uh, at the registration stage, the session is being recorded for future use and we will make the recording uh, available in, uh, in due course and indeed for members of the Institute who have a CPD uh, requirement, uh, we can follow up on that in the background as well and make sure that's, uh, that's uh, arranged. So um, uh, you see a message there kindly uh, put out by, uh, by Sandra Campbell from the Institute. So thank you very much for that indeed, uh, Sandra. That's very, uh, very helpful on the background. Uh, so a quick word about the housing agency. That's our uh, office, which uh, I was in for the first time in about uh, two months yesterday, briefly to pick up some equipment. We're down on Mount Street and we work with uh, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage with local authorities, with approved housing bodies and with other stakeholders in the sector, uh, including professional bodies. And again, our, our gratitude to uh, the RIAI for their collaboration um, today. I think it's uh, it's been wonderful to see that uh, collaboration from the professional bodies and especially in the, in the particular circumstances that we're in to make uh, to make this uh, webinar of benefit and of use and of interest to, to you in the sector. And our, our vision or our ethos is to promote the building of sustainable communities and sustainability is a, a key theme of, of the uh, subject and, and of the content that we'll be touching on uh, throughout the course of the presentation in the context of apartment buildings and multi-unit uh, developments. A quick word, of course, on uh, our whole of government approach, if you like, in terms of the COVID-19 situation. As you know, uh, full details of the 
uh, measures and uh, health uh, requirements are available on the gov.ie uh, website. So you can check out uh, the latest status on that particular uh, website. So I'll hand over now briefly uh, to Pranish Ramond uh, of, the, uh, of the Institute, Practice Director. Very grateful indeed to, to the RIAI for their collaboration. And Pranish, over to you for a few words. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing my screen now. David, um, good afternoon all. Firstly, we're delighted with the high level of interest in this webinar. Thank you, David, for the warm introduction. The RIAI wishes to acknowledge the collaborative efforts of the housing agency over recent months, in providing presentations, CBD and other events towards development of the professions, which translates into positive contributions to sustainable housing development in Ireland. We're especially thankful to you, David Ruse, um, Isola Dillon and the housing agency team John Mahoney of the RIAI Housing Committee and Omani Pike, Catherine Negan and Sandra Campbell of the RIAI, who were jointly instrumental in bringing this event to you, to your office, home or gardens. The RIAI supports and regulates the architectural profession and promotes the value that architects bring to society for everyone's benefit. Our purpose is to drive excellence in the built environment the RRAI regularly engages with government, the professions, industry clients, and the public to promote quality in architecture, to deliver quality and sustainability in the built environment, to enrich our distinctive culture and heritage, to contribute to the competitiveness of our economy, and to improve quality of life for the people of Ireland today and for generations to come. At a time when the future planning of our towns and cities are being re-examined in this new world brought on by the pandemic. It becomes extraordinarily important that we do not compromise the quality of housing, the public realm and our communities, but that we look very closely at our solutions that put people first and are sustainable at both economic and societal levels. The National Development Plan 2018 to 2027 sets out the investment priorities that will underpin the implementation of the national planning framework to a total investment of approximately 116 billion euros. The RIAI believes that compact growth and in full development requires thoughtful investment to ensure that our towns, villages and cities grow in a, in a vibrant and dynamic manner. With a new set of challenges that have surfaced over recent times, these events have some potential to influence the shape of our current approach moving forward, reinforced through careful analysis, proper planning and collaboration. With stronger focus on common goals, we remain optimistic that the challenges ahead will bring out solutions that enhance the way we work, live and interact in the longer term, as we continue to engage through forums such as these being facilitated today. And now I shall hand you back to David and John for the presentations, which I'm confident we'll find great value in. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Pranash. Appreciate your, um, appreciate your, uh, comments and uh, well indeed very grateful to the uh, institute for their uh, collaboration and uh, making this uh, webinar what we hope it will be for our attendees uh, this afternoon so our main speaker this afternoon is uh, john o'mahony fellow of the royal institute of the architects of ireland john is uh, as pranish mentioned on the uh, the leader of the housing committee of the uh, institute and director with uh, o'mahony uh, pike and i will uh, at that hand over to uh, John. And uh, John, I think you can uh, share your slides there. And uh, there you go, thank you very much. You will need to unmute yourself, John. John just having a little technical difficulty there, if you could unmute. You might just uh, try try it again there, John, and unmute. I'm sure it's just a matter of getting the right uh, setting. It should be uh, straightforward enough. Apologies for that, folks. Now, so while uh, John is uh, endeavouring to uh, arrange his settings, we will um, perhaps uh, John, if it suits you, I can go ahead and do my presentation. 
no, first. Sorry. Ah, great. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, I don't know what happened there. Everything went off my screen. So no I, was, I was suddenly looking at nothing. So, so no let me just. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, are we all seeing that then? Uh, we don't have your presentation just yet, but I can put, certainly put it up on screen if you wish. Oh. It's on my screen now. Okay. Um, I've put it up there, John, and you can uh, give me the nod to move the slides on. Okay, okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, as with all things, it was working perfectly right up to the moment somebody said you're on. Um, if I could just look at uh, context, uh, and then I'm kind of treating this a bit like a tutorial, so I will be going through the regulations in some detail, but I'm trying to present them in a format that is usable to, to everybody as a, as a kind of a ready reckoner. So in terms of context, uh, in 2007, apartment regulations were prepared with a view to firstly modernizing the standards of apartment development in Ireland and looking at best practice across Europe to move away from the old Parker Morris type area standards that were promoted in the UK in the 60s and which really continued right up until virtually the present day. And secondly, to get el eliminate the shoebox apartment that was part of the Section 25 or Section 24 uh, apartment boom. Um, and in preparing those, Tolo Mure, who was the former president of the RAI, was one of the promoters of the standards. And they proved, in my view, to be very robust. And despite a lot of press and political commentary to the contrary, the space standards weren't reduced in the 20, the apartment space standards were reduced in the 2015 revisions or in the 2018 updates, which we're discussing today. In 2015, it was clear to the government that with under 13,000 unit, units completed that year, that was less than half the demand at the time. Um, there was 6,000, over 6,000 apartments were completed in Dublin in 2006, but by 2015, just 322 were completed. Also, two bed apartments weren't affordable for a household earning an average industrial income or an average wage of combined wage of 30,000, 80,000 a year. And that unfortunately is not changing hugely, but we've come back to that. Department of Housing set up a, a working group that spanned across the entire construction industry to interrogate the current regulations at the time and to look at ways of introducing greater viability into the apartment sector. And much of the regulations were defined by the 2011 uh, Dublin City uh, Development Plan. And it included accommodation standards that mandated 85% of units to be dual aspect, a maximum of six apartment apartments would be allowed per core, maximum of 20% one bed units, and a minimum of 15% three bed units were proposed. Uh, and also residential building heights were capped uh, at six stories. Um, also, they did their own viability study which indicated the costs uh, of, of these regulations and they themselves uh, gleaned that uh, the cost 22,000 was added to the cost of a one bed, 15,500 euros to the cost of a two bed and 23,000 to the cost of a three bed. And also at that time, if you were looking at, you know, lift units per core, the average in Europe was 16, whereas uh, the city council regs were six. Um, and probably the dual aspect requirement was the most onerous and, and we did, OMP did an estimate at the time on a typical urban block of apartments with 12, where 12 cores were necessary under the regulations requiring 85% dual aspect. And that reduced to four cores if the requirement was 33% dual aspect. And these were the type of regulations that needed to be uh, reviewed and, and uh, looked at again. Um, with an estimated minimum need of 275,000 new homes in Irish cities in the next 20 years. Amendments were also needed to better reflect current household formation patterns and current demand, as well as recognizing the need for a better managed and delivered rental housing sector. Next slide. Um, the, there are six sections and an appendix in the 2018 guidelines for planners and planning authorities. I've structured the presentation so that it may be used as a quick reference guide on apartment standards and in doing so I've tried to simplify the content. I'm sure I've missed something so please uh, please stay in touch and, and, and I can up these, update this when I issue it. Uh, next slide please. Um, 
and this is section one. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is the principal area of focus in the uh, 2018 regs that add to previous updates. More flexibility in housing mix, in particular regarding uh, one studios and one bed units and making better provision for small infill sites and refurbishment uh, projects, particularly by way of relaxations on the application of the regulations. Regulating the built, built around corporate housing model, which is a new and very significant sector in the Irish housing market and reducing uh, car parking standards, which is basically to try and stop digging holes and uh, filling them uh, with uh, underutilized cars. Uh, and these are the design parameters addressed in the guidelines. And uh, on the left, you'll see a viability study, which uh, myself and a colleague of mine in OMP, Derek Murphy, completed as part of the working group that assisted the department in looking at amendments to the 2015 guidelines. The study looked at affordability of apartments at heights between six and 15 stories, and it concluded that building apartments for sale was incurring losses at all heights when compared to the price of a second-hand apartment, and building over 10 stories was a very expensive exercise indeed. And this is section two, and uh, it refers to apartments and statutory development plans and the purpose for which these regulations uh, were published. Um, so there, there are nine specific planning policy requirements, SPPRs, in the guidance document. And an SPPR overrides policy stated in development plans, local area plans, and special development zone planning schemes. This section identifies the types of locations in cities and towns that may be suitable for apartment development, subject to meeting broad proximity and accessibility parameters within walking distance of public transport, QBCs and the like. I'm showing the distances here in meters, by the way, because that's generally how they're adjudicated on by planners, uh, as opposed to walk bans. Um, the locations, so there's three locations identified. One is central and accessible urban locations, which is basically city centers. Two is uh, intermediate urban locations, which is effectively suburban locations. And three is peripheral urban locations in towns and villages. And this is meant as assistance to, when preparing development plans and the like. And just to mention here, um, we have a dilemma it, where it, a, a development falls, into which category it falls, and, and, and also just about the market. And the dilemma is we've been involved, for instance, in an edge of town site, uh, which might appear to fall into the category three, but in fact, it's, it's well connected to a near, nearby city with a high frequency rail service. So it's ideally suited to 50 units per hectare density development, but that's not attractive to the landowners who are afraid effectively of duplex and apartment development, despite the fact that we believe there is a huge demand there. So how do we convince a reluctant market to embrace higher density development? We did a viability study recently, just looking at traditional uh, housing models, and we've kind of concluded that even those ones, particularly, you know, specifically just housing, are starting to become relatively unaffordable as well. Um, so housing need and, uh, you know, why we need more more apartments. Emigration hasn't solved our housing problem, or emigration did solve our housing problem in the past, and not anymore, particularly this post-COVID uh, period. And these are the standout facts behind the need for more apartments in Ireland. Uh, the population is growing. It's likely to continue to grow post-COVID. Uh, the majority of households now are one and two persons inside, and I mean majority over 50%. I lie to the fact that by 2040, 25% of the population would be over 65. And we need to provide homes to match the lifestyle and the purses of our citizens. And as such, the guidelines are designed to facilitate an increasing number of smaller homes, such as studios, one beds and two bed apartments. And reducing the numbers of three beds will also improve scheme viability. I'll actually look at how these have been applied later on in my presentation in projects that we're working on. Um, and here are the first two uh, SPPRs, and, and they address housing mix. And uh, a provision in SPPR1 
is to increase the number of studios and one beds to a combine to a combined maximum of 50% of total units in a development with no minimum requirement to provide three bed apartments. A maximum of 20 to 25% of these apartments can be studios. And a planning authority has a discretion to accept deviations from this mix, but that can only be ac accompanied by housing need and demand assessments in the area. Um, SPPR2, which really covers building refurbishment projects of any size and smaller infill sites up to 0.25 hectares, need to offer great uh, flexibility in dwelling mix with no res restrictions in developments up to nine units, but no more than 50% uh, studios are allowed. And in schemes up to 49 units, the first nine have no mix restriction, with the balance complying with SPPR1. And for schemes of 50 plus, SPPR1 applies to the entire development. So the whole purpose here was really to start looking at these smaller sites. And you'll find as we go through the regulations that there are relaxations which apply to these two particular uh, uh, types of development right the way through the, the regulations. And also, just buried in the middle of this section is a very important guidance note that states that building design performance criteria will replace blanket planning standards regarding building heights and building separation distances. And that basically was to override this idea of maximizing heights of buildings within development plans. And then the height guidelines were subsequently then uh, issued in December of 2018. And in this, you'll see that the sunlight and daylight analytics have become a determining factor in many respects in deciding building heights, building separation distance, and in fact, subsequently housing density on uh, city center sites. And this is section three, which deals with department design standards. And SPPR3, so SPPR3 defines minimum uh, apartment areas with studios being reduced in size from 40 square meters as in the 2015 regs to 37 square meters. It, this is better to distinguish it from one bed units. And it also allows greater flexibility in adapting layouts. And the graphic on the left you'll see shows how that's achieved. For instance, two apartments are the equivalent of a two bed unit. And similarly, two one bed units are the equivalent of a three bed apartment. Uh, also, student, uh, studio, um, studio apartments are also no longer limited to build to rent projects, as in the earlier 2015 regs, uh, but can now be incorporated into any apartment development. We've, in fact, found ourselves really, th this, this adaptability is really important uh, when you're trying to work through a project. Also, for modularization, um, uh, this is starting to become very relevant. Um, SPPR, uh, so here's some of the guidance uh, regarding uh, units. Um, a smaller two bed apartment for three persons is introduced as well at 63 square meters. However, this unit type is generally intended in special circumstances uh, to meet, just to meet the part five housing requirements. I think this is rather cynical because it's restricted to a maximum of 10% of the total accommodation. Um, in my view, this is a this is really a great affordable unit type um, and it has wide applications for older occupants, separated parents and the like, and it should be allowed much more considered application in my view. And the 10% rule is carried over from the 2015 regs whereby over 50% of any combination of one, two or three bed units must exceed the minimum floor area by 10% in order to safeguard higher standards. It's important to note that built to rent apartments are excluded from this regulation. In developments up to 100 units, the extra 10% can be distributed across all units and not just 51% of the units. And the graphic on the left uh, shows basically a typical presentation of unit plans to indicate the floor areas, room dimensions, apartment typologies, and aggr aggregate floor areas, which are required under Appendix 1, which you'll see later. And that's how we generally present our information. And these are dual aspect ratios, SPPR4. Uh, the area of the 2011 uh, Dublin City Development Plan, which probably caused the most concern. And SPPR4 defines a minimum of 33% dual aspect units in central and accessible sites that is close to quality public transport. In special development zones and where good street making is important. 
A minimum of 50% uh, dual aspect are required in, uh, on suburban and intermediate sites. That's really greenfield sites or large regeneration sites where there's fewer constraints and it's easier to achieve the, the, the regulation. Um, uh, less than 33% dual aspect can be allowed. As I say, it's, this is one of the relaxations for the 0.25 hectare sites or in building refurbishment schemes. And three bed units shall be dual aspect effectively uh, and single aspect units uh, should be, shall be uh, south facing where possible. North facing uh, single aspect units may be considered where facing significant quality amenities such as parks, rivers, uh, or gardens. And forgotten in this rule is actually the power of reflection from opposing buildings and north facing units. And sometimes a north facing single aspect apartment may have the best view of development, which isn't a river or a park or a garden. And I always think never be afraid to promote good design considerations, even if they contravene the regulations, because planners, planners have souls as well and, you know, uh, can recognize the benefits of good design. And the, the graphic uh, on the left shows a typical design statement extract demonstrating compliance with this reg. And my advice from experience is don't bend yourself or your design out of shape to achieve, achieve a contrived compliance for this particular, particular reg. It generally comprises your design and it ends up, you know, wasting time. SPPR5, straightforward. Ground floors shall be a minimum of 2.7 high internally to facilitate non-resi uses. Um, and possibly in the future, uh, for non-resi uses in the future, but possibly 3.5 to 4 metre heights and ground floors of central and urban areas is considered good practice. This can compromise uh, the apartment designs. So have to be careful about that one. And the relaxation again applies here to smaller sites, 1.25 hectare sites, and refurbishing pro refurbishment projects. There's no actual uh, definition of increasing the heights in upper floors, but we find in practice that w all our floor to ceiling heights are now 2.65 from the point of view of design quality, but also for daylighting reasons. Um, the, um, okay, the, the SPPR6, let me see if I jumped ahead of myself here. Yes, SPPR6 uh, defines a maximum of 12 units allowed per core, and this facilitates a greater number of studio and one bed units while complying with the Part B uh, travel distance requirements. Again, there's flexibility on small 0.25 hectare sites and on refer projects. And the graphic on the left uh, shows uh, two typical floor layouts indicating compliance with this regulation. Um, and an observation using numbers of units per floor is not necessarily a great tool to define density, particularly when defining population density for the purposes of seeing whether you know, commercial elements are viable or whatever. And types and sizes of apartments aren't recognized within this formula. I have a certain opinion that building form and local population capacity are best calculated and understood using plot ratios, uh, gross floor areas, and persons per unit uh, matrix. Slide, this slide, uh, we're talking about internal storage. On, um, and here we have minimum internal storage and utility space standards. Uh, presses and wardrobes don't count and maximum storage room sizes are 2.3 meters to prevent it from kind of morphing into a, a bedroom. 50% uh, of storage can be located at ground or basement level. Um, and again, the small site and refurbishment project re uh, um, relaxation applies here. And there's a, I've had a couple of questions actually about this uh, particular regulation. Can storage in bedrooms be counted if it's built in, i.e. if it's stud work, stud work construction? Yeah, it can, as long as it's not kind of identifiably a wardrobe. It has to be a separate element. And similarly, can the spare area in a hot press be counted as storage, i.e. if you discount the hot water cylinder? Yes, uh, again, it needs to be a pretty good significant space, but you, you have to discount the plants. Uh, so uh, next slide, David. Um, uh, and these are the minimum standards for private amenity space. Uh, patios and balconies uh, shall be a minimum of 1.5 meters deep. And again, another question about this particular regulation, and it goes when measuring private amenity, 
community space or balconies? Must the area be measured to the face of the wall or can it be measured to the face of the glazing? Really what you're trying to assess here is the usable area. Um, so generally we measure to the face of the, uh, the, the balustrading and to the wall uh, at the back of the balcony. Next slide. And uh, effectively, uh, this slide uh, is the appendix, appendix one uh, in the regulations. And I'm inserting it here because I think it's more relevant to section three uh, uh, rather than where it's located within the regs document itself. And the regs include minimum aggregate floor areas for kitchen, living, dining room combinations, minimum room widths, uh, and minimum floor areas, uh, which are listed in this appendix. I've had a question too about uh, will COVID impact on apartment design and st standards. Um, already we're looking at how we can incorporate uh, permanent workspaces into our apartments while complying with the storage regulations. I actually have a couple of slides which I haven't included here but I will add to the uh, presentation afterwards for people who might be downloading it or keeping it and to show examples of how that's achieved. Next slide sec is section four, and this is about communal facilities in apartments. Uh, and the next section is about access and communal facilities. Um, and this looks at a number of areas. It, 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 generally in this section, it's general common sense guidance regarding access and corridors and non-statutory guidance on the types of residential community facilities to be considered in apartment developments. That's things like laundry rooms, gyms, concierge facilities, etc. It's important to know, however, that the planning authority can't impose uh, definitions of such facilities on a developer. The developer has choice in what they might be. However, our experience is that some level of facilities is now being, is now being applied to all uh, apartment developments. Uh, childcare facilities provision will be dependent on the scale of the development and provision and also what is the current uh, provision in the area uh, so you don't necessarily end up putting childcare facilities on site but on larger projects you will be including childcare facilities. Refuse storage is also pretty well common sense guidance and probably the pro proviso is about uh, providing it on street or in basement storage which really is frowned upon. Next slide. Uh, communal amenity space provision, which is the same as private amenity space, uh, and it must be separated from uh, private amenity space, ground floor particularly. And it's important to note that the need for adequate daylighting to courtyards with uh, public amenity space. And again, something to be carefully considered at the early stages in any design process. Uh, bicycle parking. Uh, this was a very big new section in the 2018 regs. It's very extensively covered. Uh, so uh, these are the, uh, the guidance uh, here on this slide. And it's been dealt with on the basis, uh, the, the regulation is one bicycle space per bedroom plus one visitor space per two units. And that's the standard. And I'm really saying here, don't underestimate the size of space required in meeting this standard. It can become quite daunting, or indeed the method of storage required and what it might look like when you're designing private amenity space. Also planning authorities have different views on how to comply with stacking and weathering requirements. So it's really, really important from your designing point of view to resolve these issues early in the planning consultation. And here we have car parking guidance. And and car parking has always been an expensive provision in apartment developments and this section proposes a maximum rather than a minimum provision. There's an emphasis on reducing or eliminating car parking in locations with good public transport and where alternative modes of transport such as car sharing are provided. In central locations such as city centres, the default policy is to eliminate parking entirely or to certainly heavily reduce it. In intermediate urban locations, planners are urged to apply a maximum car parking standard, which from our experience would be between 0.5 and one space per unit. And then in peripheral urban locations, the default is one space per unit plus a percentage of car parking, such as visitor car parking, that'd be one space per three or four apartments and the relaxation of the small sites and refurb sites applies here as well. Next slide. And we come to section five, and this is the bill to rent. And 
this was one of the biggest sections and biggest changes to previous regulations. So basically, Section 5 regulates the build to rent sector, and SPPR 7 defines what this new class is. At the time of the preparation of these regulations, this sector was seen as key, really, to accelerating the delivery of new housing at scale. And there was clear international interest from corporate investors. Also, the domestic apartment rental market was seen as dysfunctional, poorly managed, without professional skills, and it needed to provide, we needed to improve the, uh, the, the provision and the, the nature of apartments to provide modern standards of long-term rental accommodation. This sector in all its manifestations, it's better known in the property world as the PRS, uh, private rental sector. You're gonna find it called many things. Um, so when the regulations for a built rent development was being considered by the department, there was a strong lobby from parts of the property sector to spe specifically identify in planning terms, a class of housing called built to rent. This class will be distinguished from traditional forms of apartment development by way of protection of the asset with a legal time limited covenant that prevents the breaking up of a development or part of a development for sale. This device was seen as reassurance for investors and was enacted so that the investment return was protected for a fixed period and in the case of these regulations it was 15 years. Generous relaxations in regulation which, uh, which I'll cover in a moment are offered in these regulations to encourage this form of development. And did the property sector embrace this covenanted model? Well in my, ev my evidence I'd say no, not hugely. Most new apartment developments are funded by investors in the corporate rental sector because of the funding model. Traditionally, a developer will borrow from a bank to build out an apartment block. They then wait to sell the entire development piecemeal before they get a return. That's a costly exercise in time and a risky exercise, and particularly for our, develop our developers who were all bust after the recession. With the rental model, and the investor funds all the development costs up front and buys all the apartments from the developer. Uh, generate a discount in most countries, but in, in Ireland at a premium due to such strong demand. I'm not sure how that will be post-COVID. However, the covenant mo covenanted model has not been popular because PRS investors still want to retain the ability to break up the asset and sell it off at any stage, even though it will be a build to rent uh, development. And I'd say that currently 80% of our apartment work is for corporate rental sector, which is two of 30 projects are being designed as built to rent covenanted projects. I know this is rather complicated, but um, I hope that somewhat explains it. Um, and at the moment, very few developments are being built for sale, except in very high uh, value uh, locations. Next slide. Uh, SPPR 7 defines what amenities must be included in built to rent developments. They will include residential support facilities such as laundries, concierge facilities and the like. They'll also have uh, residential amenities such as gyms, meeting rooms, communal leisure areas, etc. And just to note, Basically, all our apartment developments, you know, uh, have some form of resi included these days. It's, it's kind of expected within the market. But there's no size requirement set out in these regulations as to what size of uh, accommodation should be provided. So on the left, you'll see a, a graphic which we developed a rough guide based on our experience, which calculates on a square meter per unit basis what the facilities would be. And the graphic shows a list of 17 projects grouped into category gold, silver and bronze rental accommodation and an allocation of amenity space, which goes from one to 1 1.5 square meters per apartment for the bronze specification to two plus for the gold specification. And we're doing a scheme in Balls Bridge where it's seven and a half square meters uh, per unit is the allocation. Uh, and those allocations, by the way, are to do with the nature of the specification of apartments. Uh, next slide. Uh, SPPR 8, um, uh, and this is basically a list of regulation exemptions or relaxations for built to rent developments. 
There's no restri restrictions on dwelling mix, flexibility on storage and private amenity regulation, depending on the quality of resi amenity proposed. There's minimal or no parking uh, requirement, uh, again, depending on location. And also the 10% extra floor area rule for 51% of the parts, uh, apartments is waived. And as is the maximum of 12 units per core requirement. Uh, all of these exemptions were seen as helping to fund the provision of residential amenities and services associated with this built to rent class. It's interesting in the design of these projects, in fact, it's happening in all our projects now, uh, security uh, for tenants is critical to the reputation of rental operators and therefore a central entrance lobby and secure links to all cores is a design parameter which, which leads to a need for more corridors uh, in this form of development and hence relaxation on unit numbers per core can help. However, dual aspect rules still apply. Uh, so it's really a balance for the designer. And by the way, built to rent isn't exempt from the part five requirements. That's the provision for 10% uh, uh, social housing. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got the slide here, but I, I did an analysis uh, between um, our, our, our PRS projects, which is uh, you know, our standard housing rental projects and a built to rent model. So there's eight of them. And it was just looking at how the market has taken to these changes in uh, the numbers of the types of units, particularly one beds and studios up allow an allowance up to 50 percent and in in eight the eight prs projects i'll call them they're non built to rent model projects in other words non-covenanted projects five of the projects have 50 percent uh, studios and one beds and three have over 40 percent studios and one bed so virtually all of the market is going for studio and one beds up to its maximum uh, because it sees that as an easier uh, model to rent. Mm -hmm. And in, regarding uh, three beds, four of the projects have no three beds. Uh, four of the projects have between 10 and 20% three beds. So the jury's out on the three bed unit. In the two um, built to rent models where there is no restriction on the ones and uh, the studios mm -hmm. and one beds, uh, one of them is 70% uh, studios and one beds and the other one is 73 percent studios and one beds so clearly uh we know where that where that's going in terms of the ones the studios and the one beds are the most popular in the rental sector and i would say in this in the sales in the uh, apartments for sale they would be as well because they fall into an affordability category next slide um and this is probably the most contentious uh, of all the regulations, uh, as it turned out, and it was rather innocuous when it was first considered, which is the shared accommodation or shared living sector. Uh, this is a form of uh, short-term rental accommodation similar to student accommodation with residential units or clusters of two to six single or double ensuite bedrooms arranged around shared living and kitchen facilities and with residential amenities similar, similar to built to rent at ground floor. So it's basically, it's kind of been described pejoratively as uh, student accommodation for adults. These requirements are being constantly reviewed, however, and generally the standard we've seen is eight units per cluster, certainly abroad. Um, part five doesn't apply um, to shared accommodation. And this model is seen uh, as only appropriate in very limited circumstances in central urban locations or near major employment areas such as health campuses or similar. However, there's a huge pushback from politicians and media to ban this form of accommodation as is seen as a return to the bad old days of the bedsit. I take a view that it is an alternative, very short term accommodation solution, which should be allowed, but in very controlled circumstances. And also, I think the trade off should be that the quality of accommodation and services must be significantly above the ordinary in terms of specification and finish. And one other, one other question somebody said to me, you know, will shared living survive uh, the COVID pandemic? I think it will. I mean, hotels and, uh, are, you know, adapting. Uh, prisons, <laughs> they adapt. Not that I'm saying that shared accommodation is a prison, it's not. But um, certainly I think it is a form, an acceptable form, but in, in very limited circumstances. And the next slide. Um, these, are, um, these are basically the shared accommodation uh, provisions. 
Um, this outlines the qualifying requirements for uh, shared accommodation developments, including the provision of residential facilities. Uh, and also compliance with SPPR7, so it has to be a covenanted type of development um, with residential facilities and services and amenities provided. There's no dwelling mix requirement, minimum sizes of bedrooms, uh, there's living room and kitchens uh, facilities are specified. There is flexibility in the provision of storage and private amenity and minimal parking is required for these types of facilities as they're generally going to be centrally located. They're all uh, indicated there. Um, and now we're getting near the end. Um, so this deals with uh, apartment and development management process. Um, this section covers planning application consent and management and operation of apartment developments. Um, and there's a requirement to submit a housing quality assessment with your planning application, which is effectively a schedule showing how you comply with all the various standards, i.e. you know, types of apartment sizes, uh, storage provision, etc. And the graphic on the left, which is rather difficult to leave, I to read, I apologize. Uh, it does show the type of uh, Excel sheet that we have to submit with our planning uh, applications. In fact, that can be blown up. Again, any of this information, I'd be more than happy to share with people uh, after the seminar. And uh, next slide. So here we have daylighting, sunlighting guidance to planning authorities uh, and to have regard to BRE guidance, site layout planning for daylight and sunlight. It, it, or the BS8206. Um, these are the references that are actually driving a huge amount of our design at the moment. They seem rather innocuous, um, but really when you're getting into the sharp end of design, uh, sunlighting and daylighting is a critical element. And it's, it's fair to say it's defining uh, residential densities, particularly in city areas. And by the way, my understanding is that uh, these standards were designed for suburban housing, so they're difficult to apply in some respects to urban settings. So with all our, our developments, uh, we're now using lighting specialists to assess the quality of sunlight and daylight in our apartments. And this is what's being expected by the planning authorities. And you'll see on the left there, a typical uh, analysis. Um, David is going to deal with the building life cycle reports uh, in some detail in his presentation. So uh, I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, Sorry about the mess with the uh, slides. <laughs> no problem. I think we I think we got there. I think everyone was able to see them. As I say, there'll be a recording of this available later on and indeed a copy of the slides for people. I'm going to um, very briefly uh, run through uh, my own um, uh, my own presentation and uh, touch on some of the uh, the points that uh, that John uh, mentioned. Uh, it, I suppose the context we're obviously in a, a global pandemic, no one needs reminding. And I think um, what's interesting uh, from a recent uh, uh, recent uh, read of uh, Ed Glazer's The Triumph of the City, which was published, I think, nearly 10 years ago at this stage, uh, a great graphic uh, that, I, that I spotted in that, and I've shared it in previous presentations, is the population of New York, uh, its expansion over the period from 1800 to uh, about 1960 on the x-axis. Uh, you can see it went from about 200,000 to about 7 million in 19, uh, 1930, 1940. But over that period, there were a series of public health crises, be it cholera, yellow fever, influenza, um, over time. But as the public health authorities uh, dealt with the, with, with the challenges, uh, the population continued to expand and, and the urban setting continued to be where people wanted to live. So perhaps we have shorter memories um, than, than, than we think in the sense that uh, the urban environment, the city environment is still going to be uh, relevant as a place where people, uh, people live when, when this pandemic situation perhaps hopefully settles down uh, over time, uh, acknowledging the challenge that it, that it has been. But it's interesting to contextualize the conversation. A quick look at um, construction figures in the uh, in Q2 and how they've been affected by the COVID situation. You can see uh, in the graph on the left uh, the, the the drop off in all types of construction, and indeed uh, in the uh, in the graph on the right in the red box you can see the residential construction uh, drop off in Q2 of 2020. So interesting to to see some context. But stepping back again from the from from the immediate to the more um, 
longer term, if you like, from the year 2000 up to 2019, you can see the growth uh, in apartment uh, as, a, as a proportion or as a contingent of uh, overall planning permissions. And in 2019, uh, apartments outpaced um, uh, conventional housing uh, for the first time. So interesting to, to, to take a look at the trends there. At the CSO have other figures in terms of dwelling types and the orange line there is, is apartments in terms of uh, planning permission uh, approvals. And there's some more detailed statistics there that you can, you can look at at your leisure uh, in the, um, in the uh, presentation. In terms of actual completions, as against planning permissions, uh, in Q1 2020, uh, there was a 75% increase over Q1 of uh, 2019. And you can set that against uh, the conventional, um, conventional type of housing. Um, uh, the, the apartment completions has been a multiple of that. So switching back then to the guidelines and uh, chapter six, six or section six, as John mentioned, focuses on the building life cycle uh, reports. And in the context of the big picture, we're focused here on the long-term sustainability of the owner's management company, the multi-unit development, the estate uh, in, its, in itself uh, over, uh, over time into the future. And bearing in mind that the estate is going to be managed uh, in the case of uh, conventional build to sale situations, the estate is going to be managed by the residents in the long term through the owner's management company, which is effectively a not-for-profit property management business Clearly, the comments here are, are, are not applicable to the private uh, rental sector or built to rent sector where you have a property professional uh, uh, freeholder, if you like, over the, uh, over the estate. We can see over the last four or five years, the number of owners management companies that have been incorporated. There's an average three a week. We keep an eye on the CRO registrations to the extent we can. So it's a growing sector from that perspective. And many of you will be familiar with our report last year on owners management companies, which is available on our website. We've had a quick look at the SHD, the strategic housing applications uh, that have gone in over the last period of time, which is uh, most of you will know is 100 uh, or more uh, units and uh, the uh, stats are available on board Panala's website. But to acknowledge uh, a firm of solicitors in Dublin called FP Logue uh, and uh, company, they have prepared uh, an SHD tracker, which is available on their, on their website. It's uh, open source, if you like, uh, and that has uh, tracked the progress of, of all the SHD uh, proposals over time, so useful to, to, to look at that. In terms of the actual building life cycle reports that, uh, that are to be seen in the SHD uh, applications, I suppose the spectrum of, of um, quality uh, can, can vary and the, de the detail and the, and the depth of analysis uh, is, is quite varied. Here's one for, um, here's a, a building life cycle uh, report for um, development of 200 uh, apartments and you can see the bare bones of what's been given is really just the constituent parts of the development whereas in, uh, a, a, in a separate one I've obviously anonymized these for obvious reasons uh, we have um, an owner's management company operational management plan so a quite detailed uh, and granular exposition of what's going to be uh, what's going to be the, the, uh, the plan for managing the uh, estate. And this is a very recent one um, that was submitted for 200 uh, apartments, uh, I think in the Dublin area. And the focus there is on, um, uh, again, a quite detailed uh, exposition of how the estate will be managed. So you see in the red box at the bottom, they have included a building condition report, a sample forecast of costing on the right-hand side is the uh, owner's management company, management agent, uh, plans for spending and so on. And there was a separate life cycle report over and above this uh, operational um, uh, information uh, included. So moving on then in terms of the guidelines and compliance with the, with the MUD Act, um, it's interesting to see uh, a local authority planning, um, planning permission condition. Uh, that, so this wasn't for a strategic housing development, this was to a local authority uh, outside, uh, outside of Dublin and condition in was compliance with the MUD Act. Um, specific OMC and, and a development specific sinking fund. And if we look into, again, a more recent service charge budget included in a building life cycle report, this is for a development of 142 homes. And magically, uh, the service charge budget for the estate came out at 142,000 euro, which was 1,000 euro uh, per unit. Um, I suspect that the rigor behind that was, was um, was finger in the air uh, type because the block insurance for the estate was 9,000 euro for a block of um, 142 apartments. That seemed very good value uh, for money. Moving on to the sinking fund and building investment side of things into the future. Again, the issue is sustainability here. How are the residents uh, or the occupants uh, or the, indeed the, the uh, owner occupiers or landlords, how are they going to fund the estate in future? 
the uh, Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland did some very good work a couple of years ago and provided and and um, and their analysis. Uh, really pointed up the under provision in estates, um, so it's something that needs to be thought about from the outset when the uh, when the um, development is being proposed, when it's being put together. Um, a typical building investment fund here for 40 apartments, uh, you can see the life expectancy and the uh, re reinstatement cost, if you like. The MUD Act says that um, the uh, sinking fund contribution per unit should be 200 euro per annum. If we take this practical example uh, on, a, on a back of the envelope, uh, if you like, calculation for uh, this uh, development of 40 apartments, the sinking fund is about 600,000 euro. Over a rough 25 year life cycle, that's about 600 euro per apartment per annum. So again, quite a distance from the MUD Act uh, recommendation, if you like. So again, these are the things that need to be in the minds of all of us when planning, uh, when planning apartment uh, developments and multi-unit developments, the sustainability of the estate um, into the future and how the residents will, will manage it. Interesting to see the Financial Times uh, last weekend um, had a very uh, a good article if, if you're if you're a reader if you want to check it out the uh, impact of covid on um, service charges in in um, uh, in multi-unit developments and in apartment developments in particular and uh, one commentator reflected on um, high spec uh, glazed uh, windows and glazed walls um, and in, in a situation where they need to be replaced, the residents have to move out for about 12 months. So um, I suppose there's a, there's a spectrum of, of quality and a, and a spectrum of expectation. Um, do the residents know when they're moving in that this is what's going to hit them in, uh, in 20 or 30 or 40 years time, depending on the, I suppose, the quality of the materials in the build and so on. So that's a quick reflection on building life cycle reports. I'm conscious of time. It is coming up to 12, to, uh, to one o'clock and we may have to foreshorten our Q&A session, so apologies for that. I'll quickly look at what's coming down the line uh, in future. The program for government points up um, a use it or lose it condition for planning applications of units, uh, or, uh, of, uh, the planning application of units of 10 or more, um, perhaps a building standards regulator on the cards, uh, the strategic housing development um, uh, rules and regulations in that framework uh, will will uh, will be uh, guillotined or will, will close down uh, 18 months from, uh, I suppose, the date of the programme for government, which was June. So that roughly is the end of 2021. And there is uh, a commitment to proposals to look at management company legislation as well. What else is going to impact on planning for apartments? Well, the Waste Action Plan was published by the Department of Communications, Climate Action and Environment uh, last Friday. And uh, um, a principle or a component of that is the intention to work with uh, the Department of Housing around changes to planning and tenancy laws in relation to infrastructure for waste management, for recycling, for brown bins, black bins, and so on, because there seem to be a, a gap in the uh, in the current regime there where uh, apartment dwellers aren't uh, aren't getting the most out of the potential for recycling. Tomorrow, the CSO will um, update us on planning permissions for uh, Q2 uh, 2020. So. Uh, look out for that. Ourselves, we have a lot of uh, information and resources online for um, multi-unit developments, apartment developments, owners, management companies. With uh, the SCSI and IPAV, we publish some guidance for the day-to-day -day operation of management companies during COVID-19. And some of you who with a, with a company law bent will know that new legislation came into effect on the 21st of August, allowing for virtual uh, or electronically held AGMs and voting um, for uh, all companies. A little bit of uh, publicity, we take the opportunity to advertise two webinars uh, coming in the next uh, couple of weeks. Next Tuesday at noon, we have a session with the National Building Control Office that will look at uh, building control 30 years on from um, the Building Control Act of 1990. So our CEO, uh, John O'Connor, will speak at that and Richard Butler from the NBCO will reflect on uh, the, the uh, operation of the regime in practice. And the following week, again, Tuesday lunchtime, we have a session with the Construction Bar Association looking at developments and changes in uh, construction law, high density housing. So we'll be looking at challenges to SHD uh, we'll be looking at uh, various um, niche uh, aspects of construction law there. So you're welcome to join that. All information available on our news side of our website. Um, Multi-unit developments at housingagency.ie. Drop us an email if you want to get in touch to get a copy of the slides or indeed have any queries on what we've gone through um, today. We are at uh, one o'clock. We might slightly run over time. I know we promised at the start that we wouldn't, but I think the, the quality of John's presentation um, certainly warrants uh, a, a little bit of time on the uh, Q&A. So I'm gonna pull the Q&A up 
in front of me. And John, this might be a little bit like you remember Larry Gogan and the 60, um, <laughs> the just a minute quiz. <laughs> so hopefully it won't be a question of they didn't suit you. Um, fake we'll, news. We'll, All we'll you're going to get back is fake news. <laughs> we'll, we'll fire a couple of uh, we'll fire a couple of questions, and I see one there. In respect of section two of the guidelines, where do families live if most developments are to be one and two bed developments? And that's I suppose a policy or a pejorative uh, question. Yeah, I'll throw it at you anyway. yeah, I know, and the, the regulations don't help with that. Whereas before, there was a provision for three beds, significant provision for three beds. I think on that slide, I told you that um, they. They really are being ignored to a large extent in the rental market because in the rental market, they look at who is going to rent an apartment in Ireland. And it's a studio, a one bed. They're the easiest ones to rent. A two bed is grand if you want to share. Uh, but very few families uh, want to rent an apartment yet. And there's a whole mindset change that we need to embrace in our cities, I think, to make that happen. My own view was that eliminating a requirement for any three beds wasn't a good move. Um, I think there should have been an allowance for, uh, albeit a small proportion, and uh, that may change over time. When I talked about adaptability of units in the future, there's a possibility you can knock a studio and a two bed together, and we've actually designed some of our, our layouts that way, so that in the future you could actually uh, create a three bed. That's what happens in, in uh, Europe in older developments. Very good, thank you very much. Um, the question is, um, uh, any outdoor space requirements in section five? I think you might have covered that. Yeah, there is, well, there's, there's public amenity space. There is a, a requirement, which is the same as private amenity space. Uh, and also there's guidance about uh, children's play areas, etc. So there is a requirement, yes. It's funny though, you're, you, if you're talking about high density apartment developments, uh, the public amenity space is generally courtyard space and peripheral space. And an awful lot of that, as I said before, is now being driven by daylighting and sunlighting standards. Um, and also having been to Sweden and had a look at some of their developments over there, uh, I've seen how bad they can be when you get those face-to-face -face requirements wrong and you end up with these very, very overshadowed gray and gloomy spaces. Um, um, so, uh, you know, adequacy of uh, public amenity space is still really, really important and would be a consideration in any of our developments. Another one that just jumps out at me, can the SPPR take precedence over a regeneration plan that is over four years old? Ooh. That's a toughie. That's a six marker, is it? Well, no, I, I mean, an SPPR takes precedence over an LAP, a development plan, uh, uh, or an SDZ. Um, and um, yes, I would say, but uh, don't nail me to the cross on that one. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Um, there appears to have been zero consideration given to accessibility other than adaptability. Nothing in the internal apartment standards, bike or car parking standards, etc. Why is this and is there any move to address this? So consideration for accessibility other than adaptability. Well, there is, um, they weren't included on my slides, but there is guidance. Uh, but you are right uh, about it, you know, being specifically outlined in terms of the requirement for universal access, and which is covered elsewhere. Um, yes, it's not, it's not, it's covered in, in a kind of a guidance note, but not in any statutory note. But I, I, being very interested in housing for the elderly myself, I'm conscious of uh, things, Fingal County Council, for instance, is looking at sort of 10, 10 design elements that can be applied to apartment developments to make them more adaptable without necessarily incurring great cost. Those sort of initiatives, uh, most designers should become aware of and should be trying to apply anyway. Okay, look, I think we've got a, we've gone five minutes over time and we did commit to respecting our attendees time as much as uh, possible. We do have um, a list of the of the questions that have been sent in and where they have been, uh, where people have put their names to them. We'll endeavour to, to come back to them uh, offline, if you like, um, later on. So uh, hopefully that's um, that's uh, acceptable to our uh, to our attendees. Um, I think we'll uh, endeavour to to uh, wrap it up um, there, as I say. Please do contact us, mud at housingagency.ie for a copy of the slides or any other queries. Um, if you're a member of the RAI, please do contact um, Sandra and team 
um, as she, she put the details into the chat uh, for your CPD um, requirements. I'll uh, finish up and conclude by uh, thanking most sincerely John for his time and the uh, the work and uh, effort he's put into the, the presentation. I know I can see the feedback in the chat coming up already. Um, everyone found it uh, very, very beneficial and of great, uh, of great interest. So thank you again, John, for your uh, collaboration and your, and, and your work You're and welcome. time and your benefit of your expertise. Thanks indeed to Pranesh, to Sandra, to Teresa in the, um, uh, in the Institute for their collaboration and in setting up today's session. Thanks to my own colleagues, to Michael McHale, to Mary Coffey, to Katrina uh, Lawler, who all kept me right in the background, to Isolde uh, Dillon, um, our, uh, our architectural advisor in the housing agency as well for their uh, collaboration. So with that, we'll wish you well. We hope you're keeping safe and well. Please do join us for our sessions uh, next week, Tuesday at noon and the following Tuesday as well. Um, we'll finish up there. Thank you very much indeed to everyone and have a good, uh, good afternoon. Bye-bye.